Hello, my name's Luke Howard. I'm a consultant pulmonologist at Hammersmith Hospital, London, part of Imperial College Healthcare NHS Trust. The purpose of this short film is to take you through a patient's story. My patient is Helen. We're going to hear about some of the frustrations that she had in the early phase of trying to achieve a diagnosis, the number of physicians that she had to see before she finally came to my clinic, and the value that she places on being in a clinic where she has access to advice from physicians and nurses, not just for her, but also for her husband. Helen is a real patient. This isn't scripted. This is her real experience. Helen, nice to see you. Thanks for coming in today and for agreeing to take us through your story. I wonder if you could take us back to the beginning when you first realised that things weren't quite right. Yes. Um... I am or I was a really keen runner and about last November I realised I something was wrong. I couldn't keep up with the friends who I normally run with. I also record all my data um, on my Strava app and I had evidence that showed that on repeated runs there was a downward trend so I knew something was wrong. And what then prompted you to go to see your GP? Well, actually, it was my running running friends. Some of them are, are, are in the medical profession. They said, Helen, go to your GP. You, you, you must be anemic. Go and get yourself some strong iron tablets. You'll be sorted. When you saw your GP, what did they do? Right, she was great because actually she's a runner herself, so she was very empathetic. And she took blood tests, chest x-rays, basic spirometry tests, and it all came back normal, if not better than normal. Um, and she didn't really know what it was, but she said, I'll tell you what, we'll put you on um, the waiting list to see a respiratory specialist. So that's where we were and off I went. You were waiting to see the respiratory specialist, but things got worse. What happened? Right, between February and May, I noticed that this breathlessness was beginning to impact on my everyday life. The big one for me is climbing the stairs. My goodness, it was really, really hard mowing the lawn, vacuuming the carpet, emptying the dishwasher, every everyday tasks. I was so breathless, I thought, this can't be normal. My husband and I went on holiday together, and we, lo we, we love the outdoors, um, and we were walking along and the coastline, and he's practically dragging me up, and he said, hey, there's something wrong here, you need to go back and see the GP again. You went back to see your GP again, and tell me how you then got from your GP through to seeing me in the pulmonary hypertension clinic. Okay, well at the time my GP, I was, still on the, I, was, I was still on the waiting list to see the respiratory consultant, but I pushed and I pushed and I was able to get an earlier appointment to see a, a respiratory consultant. And then based on an abnormal ECG, I was transferred to a cardiologist and I saw another one and eventually was referred to the Hammersmith. And I was delivered into your hands. Helen, we saw you in the outpatient clinic and then we brought you up to the hospital for a few days for inpatient mm -hmm. investigations. And then we finally sat down with you and gave you the diagnosis. Can you remember much about that and the sorts of things mm. that we discussed at the time? I do remember it because it was a scary diagnosis. However, the third um, special consultant that I saw had already alluded to pulmonary hypertension. And of course, I went away and Googled it. Probably not the best thing to do because it's a very scary diagnosis, as I've already said. I, I know it doesn't have a cure, and I know that it's a progressive disease. So, you know, it, it was a lot to take on board. But at the same time, you know, it was really nice to have to know there was a genuine condition because it had been uh, along the way. It had been sort of suggested that maybe it was sort of in my head or there was a bit of anxiety there, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, so it was nice to know it was a condition, albeit quite a frightening one really because it's as you explained it's very very serious. Helen we're now going to turn the tables a little bit and talk a little bit about what I remember from okay. the time when we discussed mm. your diagnosis and treatment uh, and I think the important thing from a doctor's perspective is to try to work out where the patient is how much they mm. know and also very importantly how much they want to know and how much information they can take in at one point in time. Some people want to know everything absolutely everything yeah. and some people just want to break things down and live a day at a time so just remembering going back mm. to that time I was uh, asking you uh, about the diagnosis what it meant to you also what it is you wanted to achieve what your goals were and therefore trying to balance up what kind of therapy we would give you in mm. terms of the efficacy of that versus also 
potentially side effects. And that's what tends to go into a shared decision, mm. at least from a physician's perspective. It's about giving the patient all the information that they need, but all the information they can handle. And I think that's one of the skills of being a physician and something that I keep Absolutely. learning mm. as I go along through yeah. life. I imagine it is a really tricky thing for you to have to do. <laughs> well, going back, I remember we were discussing should we go for combination therapy with mm. intravenous treatment or should we go for oral combination therapy uh, and what it is that we were trying to get you to mm. do in terms of getting you back to physical activity because I know that's so important, important for you. It's important to me, yes. Every patient is different, every yeah. person is different. What do you think is the information that you would really uh, need at the time of diagnosis and treatment discussion? Uh, I'm the kind of person who likes to know everything up front. I, I'm not one of those who wants the little sound bites to be, you know, fed in bit by bit. So I really appreciated the fact that you were so honest with me and you said, this is a serious condition. However, what you have to do is look for the things that you can do. And if, if there are things that are difficult because of pulmonary hypertension, find ways to adapt towards that. And if I can use the example of um, cycling. Um, I, I also belong to a cycling club and when I was first diagnosed I, 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 I hadn't been cycling for several months but since that diagnosis and knowing now that I have to have a different outlook on, on life uh, we invested in an electric bike and since then I've been back with a the club they've been so supportive and when I'm cycling with them I feel normal again and that's really really important to me. When we had the discussion and we finished do you look back now and think, oh, there was something I wish I'd asked, but I hadn't? There's probably not a specific thing that I should have asked, but it is, it, I remember it being a very overwhelming moment. And yes, once the team have gone, you are left with, oh, I wonder what, ha what will happen about this, that and the other. But something that I think your team did really, really well is they provided me and my family with contact details. And it was great because I could ring people or, or, or I've got email details. And so I felt, I felt supported, and if there was something particularly um, worrying me, I know that I would be able to get an answer very mm. quickly. Pulmonary hypertension can be a very isolating disease, particularly mm. because patients describe it as being an invisible disease. What do you think patients can do to help themselves? They could join the, the, the PHA, the Patients Association. I've already done that. I'm just... Early days for me still at the moment, but it's there. So it's not always just about the patient. There's also carers involved, in your case, your husband. How did it impact on him? It's had a huge impact. I'm not joking. We've literally had to change our way of life. Uh, I'm really, really lucky. Uh, my children have left home now, but my, my husband is there. And if I didn't have him there to support me through this, I don't think I'd have quite such a positive outlook because he's been my rock. He's been absolutely wonderful. It says it's huge. What sort of support do you think he needs? Oh, he's got lots of friends and uh, an extended family and he, they, he's been out and he's talked with them a lot and he needs that because it's, yes, it's been as earth shattering for him as it has been for me. It's not only my lifestyle that's changed, the whole family's has changed. How can a pulmonary hypertension team help carers and in your case, your husband? It's the inclusivity. It's when you, when after um, assessments and you come back and you, you talk amongst yourselves and then you come and you give the latest news, you, you include him in that. And that's really important because as the patient, it is overwhelming and I need that support. I need that other member of my family. And the fact that you include him in that is really, really, really matters because if he wasn't there, Oh, it would be very difficult. So I thank you that you, you know, you're so inclusive to the family and, and carers alike. How important is it to you that you're under a, a pulmonary hypertension team itself? Oh, do you know, it's really important. I know I've got the best and it's the fact that it's a specialist team. Yes, it's a long way from home, but if I didn't have that, where I, when I'm here, there are so many different nurses and doctors I can talk to. Oh, that, that specialism just doesn't exist in my locality so for me it's really really important and it's made a big difference. So your advice would be to patients out there make sure you're under a specialist oh, team? Yes, yes definitely. And maybe if I could men mention the Patients Association as well in that online they're able to talk to each other because you said earlier it can be really isolating. Now I haven't gone down that route yet but 
I see that many people talk to each other from many different places across the UK. And I think that, that that's good because you have the opportunity to exchange stories and empathise with each other. So it's important. So you have your physician and nursing expertise, but also your patient expertise yeah, all together. Yeah it's, yeah, it's all there supporting you, the supportive block. That's Thank what you. makes it work. Thank you.